to stand a little, you know, totally au fait with the, the system is that uh, obviously in a case if you are pursuing it here, not so true in the US, is that if you lose the case, you're responsible for the defendant's costs, which can be very considerable. And um, particularly in relation to foreign claims, uh, the defendants can apply for security for costs to say that, look, these people are bringing this case. If we, if they lose the case and we win, uh, where are we going to get our money from? They're mainly impecunious people uh, from abroad. Uh, well, fortunately, it kind of is a good part of how the system can develop is that in this country we have developed a system called after the event insurance, which means that the claimants can actually insure uh, for the cost of the defendant's cost. Sorry. Uh, now, in most cases, so if you have an ordinary road accident, you go to a lawyer, they will say, look, we'll get you insured. It's only a very small amount, a few hundred pounds to insure against the defendant's cost in case you lose. For these cases, much bigger, much more complex, where the cost can be hundreds of thousands, millions, or even more than that, then it is still possible to get after the event insurance. And whereas uh, the, the system has become so sophisticated, is that you can, because obviously the premium for those sorts of figures can be, you know, in themselves hundreds of thousands, is that the, the market has become sufficiently sophisticated that you can actually get what they call deferred and conditional premiums, which means actually the claimant has nothing to pay and the premium is only payable if the case is won and the defendant then ends up having to pay a very hefty premium. So it's actually worked remarkably well. The courts have accepted it as a process. So it has been a very, very important way of getting around what could have been a very significant hurdle to overcome. And Paul, do you have something similar like that in the US or is that not a... Concerned. No, we don't have. We, in the, in, okay. Yeah, in the American system, we don't pay costs if we lose, fortunately, <laughs> because we sometimes lose. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Alexa Roscoe. I'm with the LSE Human Rights Program. Um, the United States Department of State and other public bodies have published annual lists of products made with forced and child labor. To, to what extent could these lists be used to um, to, to what extent could the methods you've described tonight be used to try bring cases against the companies knowingly importing these products? Any thoughts, Martin? Or? Difficult. Um, the only experience that we've had with that so far, and I haven't had a lot of experience, but in one of our cases, um, the, having to do with um, with chocolate. Actually, um, the the they were on that list, Nestle's and some of the other big companies, um, and actually they turned that into an argument for them. They argued that because the United States Congress had not barred the importation of everything on the list, that the, that basically they allowed chocolate in, even though in some cases it was used with there were child labor involved, that that should give the companies immunity. So it's never been used by plaintiffs affirmatively, and it's been used by defendants unsuccessfully so far. So, so far, it really hasn't featured. In the UK, I mean, again, I don't think there's been even a slight sniff of such a case. Uh, obviously, depending on the facts of a particular case, one can imagine how one could just about bring a case, but I don't think, you know, it's, uh, it would be a pretty tough ask in terms of the British courts at this stage, I think. Thanks. I'm a student in the LSE's Department of Law and I believe one of Paul's pests. I'm trying anyway. Um, uh, obviously, in the traffic euro litigation, the collaboration between journalists and, and lawyers was very fruitful. Um, I'm wondering what you see uh, for the future in, in terms of this collaboration and how it could be, how it could be more beneficial. I think that, as I said in my talk, you know, I think that uh, one's got to arm, uh, as claimants, as the dispossessed of society, you've got to tr try and make your, uh, try and use as many weapons as you can, and clearly there's no question of it, but that the, the media is a very useful tool for the claimants, uh, which the defendants find much more difficult. Uh, community groups, activists, and the rest of it joining together is very helpful in any sort of case. Kind of gathering of evidence is an enormous part of a case, and uh, the more links and contacts you've got with 
NGOs, whether they're the likes of Amnesty and Greenpeace and, and the rest of it, who've been massively helpful in lots of cases that we've been involved in, um, then that is an enormous benefit to you. You, know, you. you try and garner your help from wherever you can, but uh, particularly if you can get a coalition of them. And one of the things that, that I would say is that um, a lot of times the litigation teams that form on these cases are, see themselves as helping the activists on the ground that are actually doing the work. Um, and that, that we amplify voices, we, we are able to reach different audiences um, by the litigation, but that we're only just a part of a much larger movement. Um, and I think all of us that do this kind of work feel that way. And, and when the cases work well in terms of, of highlighting these problems, it's usually because um, there are people on the ground doing the hard work of, of activism um, that helps to highlight the issues rather than just the lawyers involved. So we, we try to do that in every case that we can. Hello. My name is Ogratosh. I'm a part of the international campaign against Vedanta Resources PLC, which is in the news often these days. And um, so this multinational mining company, which has just been committing atrocious acts of human rights violation and environmental laws violation as well throughout the world in India, Zambia, Tasmania, Armenia, so on and so forth. My question to you was, this case has been dealt with in, in the Supreme Court of India and things like that, but, and it has been, it, it has received an in principle clearance and as it happens, a lot of mining companies in India have started their mining for many years now just based on the in-principle clearance. So to what extent can international law be used here to stop mining, both in terms of Vedanta as well as all these other mining companies? And secondly, in terms of there's an act in India, the Forest Rights Act, which gives a lot of, uh, which, which gives some human rights to the people who live in the forests who are being displaced and uh, yeah. So my question to you was uh, a lot of these multinational mining companies have gone out of their way to suppress this act and make sure it's not implemented. Again, to what extent can international law come in over here? Martin, do you want to start since the dump is listed here? I think one of the, one of the issues in uh, with these cases is that if you have a relatively sophisticated legal system in the home country, which undoubtedly India is, I mean it's got one of the most sophisticated legal systems in the world in terms of its uh, constitution and the rest of it, um, is that it's much more difficult to bring cases elsewhere. You know, I think court, courts, international courts, are much more reluctant to accept a case if a case if claims are actually going on in the home state. And mostly where we operate is the, uh, there's very, almost nothing going on in the home state. So I think that's one of the first issues about that particular case is the complexity that arises because the, as you say, the Indian Supreme Court itself has actually been looking at the case. But that's not to say that international law and, and cases can't be contemplated abroad, particularly where uh, the, the multinational is based in, in other parts of the world like Britain or the US. So it's certainly possible to contemplate it, but it doesn't have to make it a lot more difficult. Just echo that from the standpoint of U.S. lawyers enforcing international law under the Alien Tort Statute, we have to have personal jurisdiction over the company. And so when the company is a U.S. company, that's easy. Um, if the company does a lot of business in the United States, usually that's been enough. That's the basis for jurisdiction over Shell, for example, in New York. Um, but we've also lost that issue. For example, we were not able to sue uh, the big French oil company Total in the Unical case because the court found that we, there was not a basis for personal jurisdiction over Total for the purpose of this kind of case. So for us, what, what, what we can do about it depends a lot on whether we can get personal jurisdiction over the defendant. And, and in a I think to echo Martin's point also is that in a case where we could get personal jurisdiction if it was an in, something happening in India, I think U.S. courts would probably be open to sending the case back to India. Um, they would not be open to sending a case back to Burma, but if there's a functioning legal system, a, a forum that convenience motion is probably going to get granted. Well, I would love to ask that about even carbide, but I will hold that question <laughs> for, for after the, uh, the Q&A. 